Right, everyone. Uh, hello. Welcome. I'm so glad to see all of your lovely faces. My name is Eric Greeland. I'm the Director of Strategic Advancement for the Coastal Land Trust, and I'll be your host for the evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us. First and foremost, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording tonight's presentation. So if you do not want your face to be shown during the recording, um, I'll ask that you turn your video off now. I put a few links down in the chat uh, for sharing additional information related to tonight's presentation and also for ways you can stay connected to the Coastal Land Trust. Also, we will keep everyone on mute during the talk as you've probably already noticed. At the end, we will have time for a question and answer session. So as questions come up during Tom's presentation tonight, please feel free to enter those into the chat box. I will collect those, sort through them, and then read them out to Tom during the Q&A portion of our evening. We have a mix of folks joining us this evening, some longtime friends of the Coastal Land Trust, and for some of you, this is your first visit. As such, I want to take just a moment to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. The mission of the Coastal Land Trust is to enrich the coastal communities of North Carolina through conservation of natural areas and working landscapes, education, and the promotion of good land stewardship. In short, we save the land you love along the North Carolina coast. Established in 1992, we serve 31 counties in the coastal plain of North Carolina and have protected more than 85,000 acres. We've, sp we've saved special places like barrier islands, we've created nature parks and preserves, protected family farms, and restored longleaf pine forests. Tonight's workshop centers on one of these places, the Stanley Reader Carnivorous Plant Garden here in Wilmington. This gem is part of the Piney Ridge Nature Preserve, a privately owned property leased to the city of Wilmington for use by the public and protected and jointly managed by the Coastal Land Trust. The garden features a collection of carnivorous plants, including several varieties of pitcher plants, sundews, and the famous Venus flytrap. Fly traps, as some of you may already know, occur only or naturally occur only within a 75 mile radius of Wilmington. The garden was named in honor of Stanley Reader, a Wilmington native known simply as the Fly Trap Man. Uh, he worked tirelessly for decades for the protection of carnivorous plants, and the garden was named in his honor as a tribute to that work. It's truly a unique place to visit, one of the first places I went to see when I came to Wilmington, and it's really notable when you take a moment to stand still look close and open yourself to the absolute beauty of carnivorous plants. Someone doing exactly that is why we're all here together tonight. Our presenter is photographer Tom Astle. He's traveled the world with his camera, but for three and a half months in 2021, work brought him here to Wilmington. For 13 straight weeks, every Sunday morning, starting the week after he arrived, Tom visited the Reader Garden and documented many of the plants and tiny creatures in this small but amazingly biodiverse place. Tom grew up in Montana, where he spent every possible moment outdoors. His first close-up lens was a magnifying glass his grandfather has given him, which he taped to the front of a used 35 millimeter film camera. His photo equipment's improved somewhat since then, but his goals remain the same, to capture portraits of nature, especially the small and too often overlooked creatures around us. His passion for macro photography has taken him to Borneo, Belize, the Peruvian Amazon, Ecuador's cloud forest, Mozambique, and Madagascar. But much of his work centers on his original and current home states of Montana and California, or often simply the small rectangle of his suburban Los Angeles backyard. His photographs have appeared in a number of publications and books. More of his work is visible on his website, tomastlephotography.com. And just in case his fancy macro lens breaks, he still has the magnifying glass. Tom, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and thanks to the to the Coastal Land Trust for, for letting me do this. Uh, uh, as Eric said, I was uh, in Wilmington for work starting at the end of the July, end of July last year and through the very first uh, few days of, of November. And I when I got there, I had never been to Wellington. I had never been to North Carolina. I literally um, had never heard of people eating shrimp and grits. Um, and I I knew nothing about the place. I was, when I showed up, I was pretty far from my familiar backyard. Uh, I knew I wanted to see, see fly traps though, and I knew they grew around there. And um, 
a fellow photographer, a guy named Clay Bolt, who's a, a wonderful conservation photographer and grew up uh, or, or lived for a time in South Carolina, had sent me um, a link to the Stanley Reader Garden. And when I got to town, I realized it was less than 10 minutes from my house, so where I was staying. So after the first week, I, as Eric said, I went over there and, and got up early on a Sunday morning, figured nobody would be there between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. I was right. Um, and uh, I spent uh, a, a first day probably almost two hours there. And at the end of it, I was like, I got to come back and do this every week. And I, and I basically did that 13 weeks in a row. Um, uh, so let me uh, let me start by uh, bringing up some slides that I'm going to show, and then I will talk over them. And as Eric said, when we're all done, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and do some Q and A. So hold on just a second here. Let me share the screen. Share. And we'll go here. That's a frog from the garden, by the way, that you now see on your screens. So here we go. So uh, I do, as he said, macro photography, especially, which is taking pictures of very small things. Um, all the pictures that I'm about to show you, uh, with the exception of very few that are showing like maybe a, a certain um, aspect of my camera gear or something like that, were taken in the garden um, while I was there on one of the many Sundays. Um, uh, the the it's everything from the tiny tree frog you see in the lower left to the jumping spider to the the the, the pitcher plant mushrooms grasshopper all of what you see here. Um, the very first day I went, I just I had my camera with me, but I also had my phone, which is uh, also also a great way to take pictures most of the time because it's most of the time with you. And this is a, just a, a just a, was just a quick shot from the end showing a bunch of the yellow pitcher plants plants in in. in uh, in kind of the array along the the, the middle uh, walking path that the garden has, there's a there's a wooden boardwalk on one side and a few trails on the other side. But the whole garden is only three quarters of an acre. Uh, it's not very big. But as I quickly figured out that first day, there's a lot going on in that that small space. And if you look at this picture really carefully on the right hand side, over one of these uh, little paver stones that they have running down the middle, you can see something. Um, it's blurry because it's my phone. Um, and what that is, uh, photobombing, is what I generally go to these places for. Uh, and that's uh, the small insect life, especially. This is a um, mud dauber wasp. Uh, it's a kind of solitary wasp. They don't have a, a hive with a queen or anything. The solitary female makes a big mud nest. Uh, it looks like a, people somebody threw a piece of mud at the side of your house, which you've probably seen before. Um, and they provision it with paralyzed spiders that they catch and sting, but they're not aggressive to people at all. But like most wasps, adult wasps, and like a lot of bees and flies and beetles and bee, you know, all kinds of other insects, they're attracted to nectar. Um, and this pitcher plant, which I'm pretty sure is a sweet pitcher, um, Saracenia rubra in the garden, um, Pitcher plants have what are called extra floral nectaries. And what that means, that's kind of a fancy way of saying nectar outside of a flower. So they secrete nectar that's sweet smelling and sweet tasting. Insects come and they, uh, they try to get a little closer and see what might be down in there. And some of them, not this one, this wasp escaped with, with her life, but uh, many of them end up slipping on the slippery inside of the pitcher and falling into the liquid at the bottom where they can't crawl back out, drown, and then they are slowly dissolved by, uh, by the plant. Um, they are, uh, uh, I saw lots of these wasps that very first day. And not only that, uh, here's a, here's a here's a bit, little bit of a short video from my just from my phone. I saw this on the very first morning. It's a female carpenter bee, eastern carpenter bee, um, and she looks like she's trapped and like won't be able to get out. But I watched her. She muscled her way out of here like a rock climber going up a thin you know crack in a in a cliff face. Um, and in fact, I watched her go in and out of probably 10 different pitcher plants nicking, licking up the drops of nectar on the side. So this bee, in any case, seems to have figured out a way to, at least in pitchers of a certain size, uh, be able to, to, to survive the, the ordeal that others do not. Um, after this first day is when I decided I'm going to come every week 
and see what changes over time because all ecosystems are like that. Different insects come out at different times of the year, plants come and go, bloom at different times. And that's what I started doing. And I came to know the place pretty well. I mean, uh, uh, in a very short number of weeks, I knew what plants grew where, where individual spiders lived, where to find tiger beetles, the best spots to see frogs. I, I, on a few mornings, I kind of ended up acting as an unofficial docent. You know, people would come by um, usually just for a few minutes, sometimes tourists, sometimes locals, you know, that had not been there before. And they would see me with my, my big camera and say, what are you taking pictures of? And I would end up showing them, oh, do you want to see where a fly trap is just caught something or do you want to see where this bee is sleeping or where this little frog is resting um so it, it kind of became uh sort of a fun thing for me to do and as i said that first morning i was there for two hours and after that i don't think i ever had a visit where i was there less than an hour um the people at work uh started uh I, they would they would hear oh did you go over the weekend and take pictures because they would see the pictures on my laptop the next the next week they started calling it tom's bog at work uh, uh with no offense to stanley reader intended um and it, it really became kind of a, a respite uh in the work week for me um so let's get to the the, the venus fly traps um these are what the gardener are especially famous for. And this is a close up of one of the traps. Um, they are really interesting plants. Uh, first of all, a lot of people, you know, if, if they don't know about Wilmington in North Carolina being the place where they're from, they're from, you know, they assume there's some giant puppy eating thing in the Amazon. But but no, they're they're really they grow in this very narrow habitat in a very small area of the country, and that's it. Um, here's a close up of one that has opened after digesting a, a, a little beetle. Um, a little leaf beetle, I believe, pretty little metallic beetle, and I'll go in a little closer so you can see. Um, this beetle looks intact, but um, any soft tissue inside has been has been absorbed by the plant. If you look above the beetle, there's a little line right here where my cursor is, and another here, and another behind it. Those are the trigger hairs that cause the flytrap to close. Um, flytraps emit, uh, when they're open and ready to catch something, they emit uh, volatile compounds that smell like to some insects, they smell like flowers or other to, to rotting fruit or something. And so they attract insects with, with, uh, with the sand and, and with the color they think as well. If an insect triggers two hairs within 30 seconds, uh, the trap snaps shut. Uh, if it continues to struggle and bumps hairs one to two to three more times and continuing, the trap begins to exude uh, digestive enzymes, which don't, don't aren't able to, to eat the outer exo, hard exoskeleton of the insect, but dissolve the soft parts inside. So that's our, our lovely fry tra fly trap. And also growing there are sundews, which are, there's, there are sundews growing on every continent, by the way. There are a very uh, a common uh, 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 group of plants, and they're more like fly paper than being an active hunter, uh, the way fly traps are. This is a very uh, tight close-up of of uh, I think it's Drosera phylloformis, which is a threadleaf sundew. And um, basically they have these nectar droplets, which are very sticky like glue. And it, when, when a small insect uh, finds lands on it, attracted to it, uh, it finds itself unable, unable to escape. And they trap, the, uh, the plant actually does bend toward the trapped in insect, although it doesn't do it with the rapidity that a fly trap closes. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're also very interesting plants and people who, who grow carnivorous plants um, uh, often find them uh, uh, one of the easier ones to, to, to grow. Um, and then we have the pitcher plants, which are the bigger and showier things. This is a purple pitcher. It's, it's this particular vibrant color because this, this picture was from fall. Uh, it has fall color, <laughs> like, a, like a turning leaf. And um, I like this image because it shows, this is the purple pitcher, Saracenia rubra. Um, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, purpurea. This plant has, uh, in addition to the, the slippery interior that makes it hard for inse insects to climb out, if one does make it, it has all these downward pointing hairs to contend with, which look like teeth, but are basically uh, discouraging. It's, it's like a wrong way tire strip on a, uh, <laughs> uh, in a parking lot, and it, and it helps, the, uh, helps escapees from getting out. Um, here's another uh, the, the colors and patterns of the pitchers, which are separate from the flowers that they grow, are, are quite lovely. Um, I, I'm, I believe that this is a, a hooded pitcher, a Saracenia minor, perhaps, and then the white top pitchers, which I really like. They, they have all different um, varieties of, of amounts of red 
and and so on that that grow on them. They're they're, they're lovely plants and and deservedly popular for people who grow them. Um, but uh, it wasn't just the pictures. I was there one week, and a woman saw me with my camera, and she said. Um, are you looking for the orchids? And I was like, uh, what orchids? And uh, <laughs> she she said, oh, she, they they grow here, they, they bloom here usually this time of year, but maybe this year they're a week late. Uh, look for them, they're called white fringed bog orchids. Um, I presumably because they are a white orchid with fringe that lives in a bog. Um, it's, it's not that clever of a name, but it, it, it's, it's a beautiful little flower that indeed the next week that I came was there, but if you can look closely, you can see these are kind of decorated with, with lots of dew drops. Um, humidity is a thing in North Carolina, as I learned. Um, but uh, I moved around to the side of one of them, um, and I kind of like this view, because I think you, you could, could have named the, the orchid the mother goose orchid based on this. Um, it's got definitely that, uh, that little bit of a goose in a, in a, in a hood thing going on. Um, and that change in point of view brings me to a, a little bit to the photography. Now, I'm not going to go into like super uh, technical detail on, on photography tonight because I'm also, you know, uh, we, we don't have time for that. And that could be an entire weekend. But I will give some quick tips of, uh, of things that I think even if whether you're using a big camera or with a flash as I do or your phone that hopefully can improve your photography a little bit if you're interested in doing this kind of thing. Um, this is a little green sweat bee, by the way, that uh, that I saw one day. I, I like the details in this. I usually try to get the face of the insect, but I like you can see the tattered trailing edge of the wing. That means she's getting old. She's uh, she's still gathering pollen, though, as you can see. Um, uh, she's one of uh, one thing that a lot a lot of people know is that um, there are almost four thousand species of native bees in North America, um, and in fact, North Carolina has around five hundred just there. Uh, they are mostly solitary. They don't have a hive or a queen. They just like the wasp I described at the beginning. If a lone female digs a burrow or finds a, 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 a space under a rock and provisions it with pollen and lays her eggs, seals it up, and leaves and dies not long after. And that's how most bees live, not in a hive uh, making honey. Um, but uh, let's go on to the photography side. My first tip is go low to get into the world of the thing you're photographing. 95% of pictures are taken from four to six feet off the ground, pointed up, down, left, right at whatever you're taking a picture of. And that's because it's the height of a standing human, right? That's how most pictures are taken. Um, so in macro photography, my, my goal is, is not to um, so much make a bug look big as for me to enter their world and be their size. And so like this tiny mushroom, I'm down, I'm down at ground level with it. And I, I, when you do that, you enter that world and it becomes a more immersive thing for, for the photographs you take. Um, Second tip, which goes right along with that, is look for faces in the things that you photograph. Not maybe it doesn't count with the mushroom, but uh, this this little um, broad-headed skink. It's a it's a it's a juvenile. Uh, the there are there are at least three species of skinks, maybe four in North Carolina that the juveniles have the blue tails. This uh, little one I know is a broad-headed skink because they have five scales on their upper lip instead of four. Otherwise, it would be a five-lined skink. Um, one of the two kinds there, I think. Um, but the when you get down and are looking at tiny creatures like this, this is a very small lizard. It's just a, a youngster. Um, you know, they're they're not us. They're other. They don't have movable faces. They 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 have, I would say, a permanent smile in the case of this little this little skink. But um, engaging an audience into the picture, the eyes are the first place we look. We look for, as humans, for faces, for familiarity in the objects that we look at and, and, and the creatures that we look at. And it's, it, 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 I, I have always, I've been taught and I've always tried to, to remember that when I'm taking pictures. Um, uh, along with that as well is, this is, a, by the way, a Carolina mantis. Uh, uh, it's a, an insect that I saw quite a few of in the garden. They're hanging out a lot. Everybody likes mantises, except for flies. Uh, don't always center everything. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about composition in a, in, in later in a, in, a, in a different way, but in general, 
plunking the face of the thing right in the center of the frame can sometimes be good. I mean, sometimes um, um, a composition that is that is uh, symmetrical and centered is just right. But often if you give a little room to one side, you can show a little bit more of the habitat. You can give a little room to the direction that the creature is, is looking. Um, this, by the way, uh, this spider is a, a, a it's a type of jumping spider uh, called a brilliant jumper, Phytibus claris. Uh, jumping spiders can spin silk, but they don't make a web that they catch their prey in. They are hunters and ambush predators. Uh, this one was crawling around a pitcher plant looking for anything else that was attracted to it, um, which would they would then leap on. You can kind of tell by the fact of, of these large central eyes in the front here, they, jumping spiders have some of the best vision of, of, of any arthropod. Um, uh, and, and actually, um, this has nothing to do with th their vision exactly, but has to do with their eyes. A study came out just this week that somebody was studying sleeping jumping spiders and discovered that when they're asleep, uh, the, their retinas, which are inside their head, move kind of similar to the way we have rapid eye movement sleep and their limbs twitch. So it has a lot of people wondering, are spiders dreaming? And we didn't even know. Anyway, uh, jumping spiders are uh, often people call them the gateway bug because they have these kind of endearing faces, um, and um, they're always a, they're always a, a favorite of mine to, to find. And this particular species I had not seen until I was in North Carolina. Um, last uh, tip is study before you shoot. Uh, this obviously was taken in L.A. This is an L.A. Uh, Los Angeles area field guide. If you were going to take a trip to Paris or if you were going to take a trip to London or, or somewhere, you'd, you'd buy a guidebook or you would go online and look at the places that you wanted to see, the sites that you want to see. Well, nature works the same way. Uh, almost everywhere you go, everywhere you live, has field guides to insects, to birds, to plant life, mushrooms, whatever, for the area that you're in. Um, uh, North Carolina, I happen to know, um, because I utilized this while I was there, has a terrific online um, guide to its native bees, which I remember I told you there are 500 species of. So there, there's always things to look for. And if you do that, um, you, you kind of at least have an idea of what to look for before you get to a place, or as the case may be, what to look out for. Um, this, uh, is, this fuzzy thing is a fuzzy caterpillar who has made short work of this leaf you can see. It's a black-waved uh, flannel moth caterpillar. Um, uh, and they're really fuzzy and the moths they turn into look like stuffed animals are completely adorable. But this is a non-pet caterpillar. If you go very, very close under the fluff, see all these kind of brown tipped, sharp pointed things. Each one of those is like a hypodermic needle full of venom. Um, and uh, if you pet it, it will ruin your afternoon at the very least. Um, and, and might, uh, depending on how sensitive you are to the venom, send you to the hospital. Um, so learn what you're, what you're about to encounter before you go. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples using those tips with some pictures I took. This is a, um, a red-headed meadow katydid, uh, it's a beautiful insect, which I had never seen before. And it's perched on top of a yellow pitcher plant. And I like this picture. I like that you can see the whole insect. Um, you know, you can, you can see the, why it's called what it's called. I like the, the, the plant that it's sitting on. Um, but I found another one and I got a little closer and I found its face and I took this. And I think this is a much more engaging or dramatic anyway, photograph. And I like this picture for a couple of other reasons. Um, you saw the praying mantis a minute, ago, a minute ago with its four legs that are good at you know grabbing and holding prey. Well, most katydids eat plants. They're like grasshoppers and crickets. But if you see the spines along its four legs, those aren't just for protection. Um, these katydids are omnivores. Uh, they'll eat plants, but um, if the right bug happens by, they're not, they're not af afraid to grab it and uh, chow down and get some extra protein. Um, the other thing that I like about this picture, uh, it, it's a good way of, of uh, introducing you to insect eyes. These look like they have, uh, the, the eyes here have pupils. That's not technically what that is. It is a what's called a pseudo pupil or false pupil. And what it is is an optical effect of the structure of this compound eye. These compound eyes, insects compound eyes can have dozens, hundreds, even thousands of individual um, light sensing cells arranged like a honeycomb. And they have their, their imagine them as a, a bunch of tubes standing on end gathered together into this globe shaped. Um, when light falls on it, if the if we're looking 
directly down the tube into the center of the, the, of the um, individual light sensing cell, which is called an omatidium. Um, the light is absorbed at the bottom and does not bounce back out. But if you look from an angle, the light ricochets inside and comes back out again, the, the visible light to you, which means that anywhere that you're looking direct, that the, that the individual little honeycomb cells are looking directly at you are dark or even black. And so that means that no matter where you move, it'll look like this insect is looking at you, kind of like that creepy painting in your grandmother's house. So, um, so that's our that, that's one thing that I like about this. Here's the second example. This is a um, gorgeous little dragonfly. I believe it's a female little blue dragonlet, which is one of the two smallest species of dragonflies in North America. Um, they are, it's, it's only about an inch long, which is it's very small for a dragonfly. Um, and I like this picture. I like the diagonal. I like the, that the eyes are nice and sh the compound eyes are nice and sharp. And it, it demonstrates what I was telling you a minute ago about how you can see it's a whole bunch of cells packed together to create one image. But, um, and it's hard to get up close to dragonflies. And this is just with my 100 millimeter macro lens. I wasn't using a telephoto, um, but it was a very chilly morning and it was just roosting. So I moved very slowly and I got down into the muck <laughs> on my knees and I got this picture instead. And I like this picture better because look at the face. Dragonflies look like they're smiling. Now it's not a nice smile if you're a small flying insect, I suppose, but it, 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 it's more engaging to the viewer, I would argue. Um, let's go in a little closer. You can see the, the uh, kind of the way that the um, pseudopupil works here, but you can also see the detail in this single dew drop. Um, I have to talk about dragonfly eyes for a second because they're so cool. Uh, human beings have trichromatic vision, meaning we have three color sensing um, uh, uh, I think they're called opsins within our eyes. They, they see red, blue, and green, and then combine in our brains to make all the other colors. Insects can see more colors than us, including into the UV range. Um, and in the case of this dragonfly, it can even, see, it sees faster than we do. This tiny insect, which is only an inch long, so you know this head is not very big, has a brain that can process up to 300 images per second. The best a human being can do is 60, and frankly, most of us is around 50. Um, they, they literally are seeing things that for us are between the frames of our vision, um, which is why it's so hard to swat a fly, by the way. They, they, they see more of our movement they see us as moving slower, I guess, would be one way to look at it. Um, they see faster than us. And I just think it's amazing, not just that, but the idea that that something was what, what, that we think of as an automaton, something that doesn't think, has a brain that can do stuff that ours can't. Um, some dragonflies have up to 30,000 of the individual light sensing um, lenses in their eyes. Um, and, you know, that is all put together and to make one kind of strange, you know, a uh, uh, wide angle image. And, you know, they're, they're active visual hunters, so that's why they have that. Um, another interesting thing, though, is you see this stripe across it, where it's red on top and blue on the bottom. Um, there's some thought that, that part of that is sort of natural sunscreen. But I read a paper uh, not long ago that said that the lower section of the eye is more sensitive to long, long wave light in the greens and orange range. And the upper part of the eye, of the compound eye, is, is more sensitive to shorter waves in the blue to UV. And why would that be? They think, well, one of the reasons might be that for a flying insect that hunts insects on the wing, if it's more sensitive to blue and UV looking up than uh, a gnat or a mosquito flying by against a blue sky, which the blue sky will appear brighter, which will make that insect appear more silhouetted and easier to see. So it's it's just an uh, it's just one more amazing thing about about these creatures that you learn the closer you get. Okay, so some challenges of macro. One of the challenges is the same with all wildlife photography. It's that things don't stand still, or in the case this case, you know, they can fly away. And in macro, they only have to move an inch and they're out of your viewfinder. So, um, but there are. There's one specific one that I'll that I'll talk about. This is about as technical as I'll get in, in, in this talk, and it's depth of field. The closer you get to something, the less is in focus that's in focus front to back. This is a picture of a single monarch butterfly egg. This is about the size of a, you know, maybe a poppy seed. It's quite small. Um, and as you can see, 
the, the edge of this is in focus, but the whole egg isn't even in focus. Like the back, as it slopes toward the top, that's not even in focus, just this thin little bit. Um, and one of the reasons for that, is, or I mean, one of the things you can do to combat that rather, is uh, if you have a camera with a, a changeable iris, like I'm demonstrating here with this lens, um, a smaller opening will optically give you more depth of field. And that's great, but um, what happens when you close the curtains? It gets darker. So now you have an underexposed picture unless you do something to make up for that. And you know, you could have a slower shutter speed, but you know, insects move quickly and, and you're gonna end up with a blurry picture even if it's even if it's technically you know in focus. Um, you can change the ISO, which is basically your camera sense, uh, electronic uh, sensors sensitivity to light, but that makes the picture grainier. So what a lot of macro people do is they add light back by adding diff diffused flash. And here's a couple of examples of these are sort of homemade rigs that I have on my camera. I have a flash unit atop my camera with a sort of hood with it's white inside the light bounces around and comes out through this this diffusion material. Um, here's another example of a flash unit that I have used in the past, has these two flash heads and they blast their light through here. Now, why do I say diffused flash? Um, I'll show you in a moment, but, but by the way, this is a super cheap thing to do. Um, if you, have, you can get these flexible chopping mats on, you know, at Bed Bath & Beyond or on Amazon or whatever, glue a little bit of packing foam to them and shine the, the, the your flash, or flash your flash through that, and uh, it will diffuse your light. If you don't diffuse your light, and uh, first of all, apologies to all Charlotte Hornets fans who may be listening in at this time, um, this little one inch wide uh, Lakers pin is a shiny little uh, enameled pin. This shot was taken against a white background with uh, undiffused flash, and it's like being outside on a sunny day. There's a harsh, bright shadow, anything metallic, has a ton of glare on it and is frankly overexposed. And I can do a little bit of processing to fix this, but it's really, uh, this picture is, is never going to be great. Um, but if you put diffusion material in front of your flash, this is what happens. The shadow becomes soft and indistinct, like on a cloudy day. Um, you get more detail and more, there's less, there's less, there's less glare. And even though this is bright, it's not overexposed over here on this metallic gold side. Um, this is really helpful when you're taking pictures of objects with a lot of reflectivity, like this sunny bee waiting out a rainstorm or a frog's eye. Um, in this case, you can see my camera lens and part of the diffuser. Uh, there's some plant in the way here, uh, reflected in the frog's eye in, in this picture. And so adding diffused light allows you to stop down your lens for a smaller opening for a little more depth of field, but it also makes your light easier, more pleasing uh, to look at. Now, that doesn't mean I don't use natural light ever. I, I like it a lot, but I typically look for natural light late in the day or early in the day when you're getting nice backlight or edge light around something and you don't get as much glare and harsh shadows. I use the light uh, earlier in the day, like, as I said, I was going to the, the garden at 7.30 or 8 every morning, uh, every Sunday morning, um, and this is, a, the, you, you get a little bit more pleasing images this way, I think. Um, natural light can also give you great backlight, which is great for things like spider webs or silhouettes, you know, of, of something against a, 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 a tree or whatever uh, against a bright sky. A um, uh, little stop for this spider, by the way. This you probably have seen if you are back east. You've probably seen these webs in bushes. There's often three or four to a bush. Even um, it's called a bowl and doily spider uh, because the main web looks like a bowl sitting on top of a table with a little doily underneath it, a little bit of lace or whatever. Um, this kind of messy tangle above is not sticky web. It's it's basically just running interference. So a small insect comes flying along doesn't notice the web when it's not backlit in the sun, bounces off all of this and ends up ping-ponging down where it lands in the bowl where the spider grabs it. But the spider is not in the bowl. The spider's under the bowl. It let, waits beneath there and bites through the gap in the in in in, in the gaps in the web. Um, I presume it does this out of self-preservation a little bit in case the insect that lands in there is um, fighting a little bit too hard. Uh, this was taken right after I took the, the previous photo. Uh, this is a, a spider that's only about four or five millimeters long, quite small. Um, 
But in this case, I used natural light and a little bit of flash. And I did that because if I the natural light was so strong coming behind, you can see it's lit up the web above there, um, that the spider would have been would have just been black. I mean, maybe I could have seen a little bit of the translucent legs because they're kind of a yellowish orange and sort of clear. But um, I added a little bit of fill flash to front light the spider a little bit to pick up what otherwise uh, would have been lost uh, in, in, in the brightness of the background. Um, so composition, let's talk about that for a second. I mentioned not always centering everything and trying to um, you know, get down at the level of, of, of the creatures that you're at and, and look for their eyes and faces. And, and I do that here, but uh, let's get a, little, a few more extra things that again, it doesn't matter whether you're using your cell phone camera or a camera like mine, uh, look for diagonals. Uh, first of all, they make a composition a little bit more interesting sometimes. Um, and with very small creatures like insects, what's the longest uh, measurement of a rectangle? Well, it's the diagonal. So if you want to get a small, more of a small thing in a picture, if you put it on a diagonal, you'll get that. Um, also, in this case, I liked that the, this small damselfly um, uh, roosting on, on this uh, grass stem uh, you can see that even though it's very tiny, it has a little bit of weight because it's bent the stem, the stem to the right slightly by roosting on it. Um, I think it makes it just for a little bit more interesting picture. Look for curves as well. Uh, here's, here's a sundew that uh, um, it has previously caught some sort of insect here. I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking at. Um, it's, it's, um, you can see how the other uh, little tentacles with the with the sticky parts have bent over and, and held it. And it's this this bug's long gone. Um, but a curve like this kind of dr dr pulls your eye through the image and you kind of you, you kind of follow the yellow brick road along this. And uh, again, I think it engages the viewer a little more. There's also one more detail in this picture. If you look down here at the bottom, see this little black speck? Um, this happens all the time in macro photography. Uh, I didn't see this until I was looking on the computer. Uh, this tiny thing about the size of a period at the end of a sentence is a parasitic wasp. Uh, I do not know the species of it, but there are thousands of species of, of parasitic wasps that, that are uh, uh, many times they, they parasitize caterpillars or insect, other insects, eggs or other bees or wasps, or um, for almost everything in the insect world, there is a parasitic animal that comes after it. But it's interesting, it, it also fell prey to the sundew, but uh, I only saw it because I looked uh, on the computer later. And then another uh, compositional thing that you probably have heard if you've ever taken an art history class, because it's been around for hundreds of years, is the idea of the rule of thirds. And it's it's a good suggestion, I would call it the suggestion of thirds, but it, it really is a way to, for some reason, um, it, uh, it often makes a, a, a composition a little more pleasing. Um, if you divide your frame into thirds, horizontally, horizontally and vertically, and you place things along these, roughly along these lines, and especially at the intersections of these lines, um, it's a good compositional tool to, and if you look around, look at advertising, look at movie posters, next time you go to an art museum, you'll see it in, in, in interesting places. Uh, you will, for example, um, almost never see, you'll see it sometimes when it's being done very intentionally, but if you see a landscape, almost always the horizon line is on the lower third or the upper third. They'll almost never divide it directly in half. And again, that, there's always exceptions. It's, it's really the suggestion of thirds. Uh, and it works uh, vertically as well. Uh, Left-hand side here is a female green link spider. Uh, this is all natural light. As I said, you know, you can see it's all backlit and she, the light actually was so bright, it was actually making her head kind of glow there. Um, she is, uh, she's at that intersection right there, part of her. Um, the frog the same way. This is a, this is a fill flash issue, but I've, I've put the frog's eye at that spot. And uh, again, I think it's just, there's something about the, the, about the rule of thirds that is a great at least starting point for, for composition. And last, uh, there's a thing here that is, this was the hardest thing for me to learn, and I still struggle with it sometimes, as I'll show you in a second, is the idea of what's in your picture that you're taking a picture of that you're not taking a picture of. Meaning your subject, my subject in this case, is this tiny jumping spider at the edge of the top of this picture plant, um, um, contemplating a, a leaf into the, uh, a leap into the oblivion. Um, but, the reason my eye goes so quickly to it is because there's nothing else distracting from it. Um, very little in this picture is in focus except for a little bit of, of the edge of the of the pitcher's um, leaf. 
The same true of this picture of a green anole. It's you know a very common lizard. There's no stray grass stem. There's nothing else distracting you. You go, your eye goes probably goes straight to the eye. Maybe the claws set after that. Um, nothing else to distract from the image. And this is a place where the lack of depth of field in, in macro photography can can help you. Um, it is a it's a, it's a way to focus the viewer's uh, eye exactly where you want it to be. Now. Here's an example of a picture I don't really like, which I would normally never show anybody. But uh, this is a, a Carolina mantis on the side of a pitcher plant waiting for something to happen by one morning. And it's in focus um, and everything. <laughs> Exposure is basically fine. But there's two things I don't like. One, she's in full sun. So even though I'm using fill flash, the full sun's overwhelming the picture. And I'm getting these crosshatch shadows, which I, I don't know, they're not terrible, but I but I I find them a little bit distracting. But the worst part is the background for me, right? This kind of pale dead center slash across the middle in the background is 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 the wooden boardwalk at the edge of the of the garden there. Um, and I, as soon as I took this picture, I was like, ugh, I, I hate the background of this picture. Um, I wonder if I can move around without disturbing her. And I very slowly did that. And I moved to the other side of the plant and got this shot instead. And it's basically the same picture, except that, and she's turned her head to look at me because mantids have very good eyesight. But now I have a blue contrasting background, a little bit of yellow, which picks up the yellow in her eye, I think. Um, I, I just, I, I think this is an example of how take a little more time, look at what you're taking a picture of. And if you can, sometimes things fly away and it doesn't work. If you can pay attention to what you're not focusing on and look at what you're not focusing on instead for a moment and make sure it's what you want in your picture because it's going to be there. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about one of the reasons I really like this kind of photography. It's behavior and biology. Um, and uh, one quick trip, by the way, is quick tip right away is this mantis is grooming her um, four legs here. And it make, makes for a really interesting pose. And she's doing this because mantids almost always do this after they move to a new spot. Um, I saw her, uh, this is a different one than in the previous picture, and when she moved, when I walked past the plant that she was on, she just moved, you know, maybe an inch or two. So I got down low on the ground, I waited, and after she settled down, she started grooming her antennae, grooming her, her legs. Uh, it's, 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 uh, you, you see katydids do it, you see, you know, mantises definitely do it, um, other insects, some beetles do it. And it's, it's almost akin to when we sit down in a chair, you know, we kind of, once we feel settled, we'll smooth our pants and maybe adjust our collar and kind of shrug our shoulders. And, and these insects do the same thing. And if you know that, and if you're willing to wait, you can get a better picture sometimes than just a straight on shot. Um, look for predation. Uh, this is a, one of those redheaded meadow, meadow Katie dids. And from a distance, I thought a spider had grabbed it. When I got a little closer, I saw it was this, an assassin bug. Uh, this has not grabbed it yet, but you can see it has its four legs cocked back, ready to grab. It's carefully moving. It took it almost 15 minutes to move an inch uh, closer to this, and I watched the whole time. Uh, assassin bugs, uh, they have a beak. You can see this backward pointed proboscis, which is kind of like a switchblade. It pops out and they stab into their victim, inject uh, venom and, and digestive enzymes, and uh, that's that's all she wrote. Uh, uh, Finally, just a moment after I took this picture, the, the, the assassin bug decided it was close enough, made a grab, the Katie did leapt. I didn't see where they landed. Uh, my money's on the assassin bug. Um, here's another one that I like to call uh, Mrs. Fly's bad day. Um, this is a, a, a small fly that was crawling out of this pitcher plant, which it looked like it had narrowly escaped from, only to be facing a green lynx spider, which was waiting. Uh, green lynx spiders also spin webs, but are ambush predators, uh, uh, much like jumping spiders. And uh, uh, as it turned out, um, there was a little more going on here than I thought. Uh, first of all, the fly was grabbed at by the spider, but was quick enough to get away. Um, and it turns out she did not escape this pitcher plant. These, there's a, there's a, a, a group of spy, uh, of flies um, that, uh, that are in the flesh fly group uh, that use pitcher plants to breed in. They lay their eggs in there. Their larvae can, you know, eat the, the drowned victims of the pitcher plant. Uh, and then when they're ready to go, she, this one is either finished laying eggs or maybe she's just, uh, is new to the world and is ready to fly off. But it's another example of how these plants have sort of an ecosystem built around them. This bug, not so lucky. This is a, a, a two-line spittle bug. 
Um, if you've ever seen on plant stems, like on grass or other little bits of foam, the nymphs of these are what uh, make that. It's a pretty little bug, but it had fallen into this purple pitcher where it was kind of doomed to drown. Uh, but I looked closer, there was something else moving. And if you look really close here, right under the spittle bug, there is a mosquito larva. And as it turns out, there are two species of mosquito that only breed in the liquid inside purple pitcher plants, not even any other species of pitcher. And they, like the fly larva I mentioned, uh, subsist on the drowned victims of the plant. So um, they often, once they hatch out into the adult mosquito, do not bite humans. A few, a few, few of them, sometimes they will, but it's rare because they get enough protein from where they, where they are as larva uh, to, to, to form their eggs as an adult. Um, there were always lots of spiders using the pitcher plant. This is a little crab spider, Cinema parvulum, I believe. Um, what's interesting about that, if you look, see a little bit of web up above it, uh, it actually had made itself a little hammock, almost like a mountain climber, you know, on a cliff face uh, where that it retreated to. Um, and this pr presumably would keep it from, from falling back in. This jumping spider has done a kind of a similar thing. It's got, you look very carefully there and there or to the right and left of its legs, it's got a couple of uh, bits of silk that it can hang on to so that it doesn't fall in. That being said, uh, spiders are often uh, fall prey. So although to, to pitcher plants, so even though it's a, it's a great place to um, find, uh, find uh, prey arriving, you know, other things that are attracted to the pitcher, it's not without its risks. Um, this uh, is a bee butt. This is the back end of a, uh, a, a another um, carpenter bee. And I saw this on the second to the last week I was there. I looked way down at the bottom of a, a pitcher plant and I thought, well, here's one that didn't make it. Um, and I tried to photograph it, but it's probably a foot down this pitcher. It was very difficult to get light in there. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll come back in about 15 or 20 minutes. You know, I wandered the rest of the garden, waited for the sun to hit the plant, hoping some, some, some sunlight would, would help make the pitcher glow. And when I got back, uh, he was looking back up at me. So this bee did not perish. This bee just slept there overnight. Uh, I know it's a male, by the way, because in, in the Eastern Carpenter Bee, the, the females' faces are black. The males have this white uh, square patch on their face. Um, and as I watched, he just started muscling his way out of there, just the same as that female I showed you in the video at the beginning. See how he's bracing, he's not so much using his claws, he's bracing the sides of his limbs against the side, and he just, you know, kind of muscled his way up and out and flew off. A quick little detail, there's a little mite on him. Uh, this one, I don't know if it's one of the mites that are usually on them. These bees often carry a, a load of mites that aren't feeding on them, they just use them as uh, as uh, basically transportation because the mite can't fly uh, back and forth and where they pr they'll live in the bee nest and um, sometimes they can be harmful but often they'll eat just the detritus and and um, and sometimes steal some of the pollen stores of, of the bee. I, this may not be that species, this may have been, been a mite that was just down in there and is now getting a ride whether it wants it or not, but anyway this this bee was fine. Um, and finally this this brings me to uh, the last week I was there. Uh, I saw another carpenter bee when I got there. It was a very chilly morning. This was Halloween morning, um, I believe. And uh, here's a little camera video, just phone cam video. It's not moving because it's asleep. A, a thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that bees do sleep in often in flowers or as I've learned in pitcher plants. This one was just hanging onto the edge and there was a little bit of a breeze, um, but uh, but I managed to, one of the last pictures I ever took in the Stanley Reader Garden, which was this one. I'm very happy with it. It's, uh, you can see the little bits of dew on the bee's face and it's just hanging on the edge of that pitcher plant, um, um, being a very cooperative photo subject for me. So here, here are my kind of final thoughts, final bits of advice. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, go on an expedition to the familiar. Uh, explore your own backyard, no matter how small or mundane you think that piece of the outdoors is. Uh, the flower pots on your balcony or your literal backyard at your home or the city park where you walk your dog or have gone for a run a hundred times. Um, go there again, but this time slow down. Look down, get closer. See what visits the flowers, see what hides under the leaves. Try to notice what lives where usually blindly your footsteps fall. And if you do those things, 
I promise you, you will make discoveries and the familiar will become new and your backyard will get bigger. And then if you travel, take those, those powers of observation with you um, and they'll work the other way around. The new will become familiar and that'll make your backyard bigger too. I'm proof that it works because even though I live in suburban Los Angeles, my backyard now includes three quarters of an acre of fly traps and frogs and 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 insects and orchids and sundews and spider webs all the way across the country in Wilmington, North Carolina. Also, I'm now kind of obsessed with shrimp and grits. So as for the photography, don't give up. Uh, keep practicing. Not all days. The, pic the pictures don't always turn out. Uh, I showed you pictures that did, not the one that didn't, and not the ones that didn't. And trust me, I take plenty of those too. So don't get discouraged. Uh, and finally, um, here's some little information about the Coastal Land Trust. Uh, Eric gave you his uh, in, uh, general intro at the beginning. Wonderful people if you're looking for a place uh, to, to make a donation. Um, thanks for, for listening. And now I, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that anybody has. Tom, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, even for someone like me who reads so much about these plants and insects, I think I've got like a half a sheet of paper of new notes of fun facts I can share with others. Uh, so certainly appreciate there. And the photos, of course, were astounding. Uh, this is a good reminder for everybody. If you do have a question, since you're all automatically muted by Zoom, please uh, send it to me um, or to everyone in the chat box and I can repeat it here to Tom. Uh, one of the first ones that came in for you, Tom, came from Scott. He said, I've heard that Venus flytraps can count, count being in quotes. Is that true? Um, if so, are you able to provide an example? Um, yes, it is true. Uh, it's, 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 it's been written about. It's, it's, it's something you can definitely look up. Basically what happens is the plant, um, and, and I'm not a botanist or an entomologist, but uh, the way it works is that if an, in, if an insect or something, raindrop, touches a single trigger hair, the trap does not close. If two trigger hairs are touched within 30 seconds, it closes. But if longer than that happens, it doesn't close. If it closes, but then no more hairs are, are triggered, a third or beyond, it'll eventually open out, up again because it doesn't want to waste energy on what may have just been a raindrop or may have been an insect so small, a, a, a gnat or something, that it's not kind of worth the plant's trouble to spend the energy on, um, on you know, giving out the digestive enzymes. But if an insect is struggling inside three, four, five times, the, the plant can dose the amount of digestive enzymes it needs based on how many times those trigger hairs are touched. So yeah, they, they, they kind of do it. And I, I have fly traps in my home window. I've had them for years that just that are, you know, domestically raised ones. And, it, you know, it's interesting if you, if you do touch one of those hairs, nothing happens. And if you, and I've done the timing thing where you wait, you know, I'm waited, I think a minute and I touched a second one, nothing happened. Um, and, and the plant is, is trying to conserve its energy in that way because an individual trap can only, you know, close and reopen three times, maybe four at the most. Um, so they don't want to waste their energy closing on something that's not uh, a meal. So. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Yeah. A good, good little fact about our famous Venus flytraps and a reminder to us all as much fun as the experiments would be, please don't try it on the flytraps in the garden because they do have that limited number of closures yeah. for each one. Uh, a couple of questions that um, come in through other channels. Um, do you happen to know what months the fringed orchids you showed are present or most visible in the garden? Uh, I could, I'd have to look up the actual date I shot the photo, but um, the, uh, I'll try to do that on my phone while I'm talking. I was there, my, my, the first week I was there was uh, uh, either the first weekend in August or the last weekend in July. And I didn't see the orchids till at least a month later. Um, so hold on. I, I'll, I'll, they're really pretty. They grow on a stalk and there are several of them. And, you, and in, in this garden, you have to stay on the path that goes down the middle or on the sides. And some of the um, some of the orchids are right in the center, but if you have a little bit of a telephoto lens, it's easy to get a photo. And sometimes a few of them were, were growing closer to the um, closer to the to the edge of the path, which made it a little bit easier. All right, hold on, I'm getting there. 
looking back through my Wilmington photos. I, you know, I don't know the month off the top of my head, but I would, but it's, it's, it's not till at least the end of August. Sorry. That's all right. Well, going, going from a question about time to one of location, if your memory serves, um, in one of the last photos you showed, there was a less common variety of flytrap, um, and somebody was curious to, to know if you remember where the photo was taken since they themselves have not seen that particular species in quite a while. Um, a flytrap or a picture? Um, flytrap was it how it was written, but it may have been a it may have been a picture plant. Um, I'd have to know exactly which the the picture of the of the <laughs> of the flytrap with his head stuck with a fly with his head stuck at the very end. That's actually my kitchen window. Um, so that's a, a cultivated variety of flytrap with shorter teeth. Um, so that wasn't in the garden. Every other picture was was it was in the garden. Um, let me. But I don't know the the most of the fly traps in the garden are they're well they're kind of all over but they they grow very low you know, as as most people know and so the, it's the the biggest number of them were at the very end of the garden from from where you first come in but they are they're all along the way all, all all along the path I don't know some some are some are redder than others and there might be some. Um, some of that that's genetics, but I also did read that uh, some of the brighter redder traps are a plant that needs food. So it's 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 redder because it is is basically showing um, it's trying to attract more insects. You know, it's it's using not just the the nectar and the scent, but the color as well to help to help you know get things get things going because it, because it needs a meal. Yeah. Yeah, the note that just came in is they're referring to the fly trap with the more triangular teeth with teeth being the quotes as opposed to the more spine shaped teeth so it may well have been the yeah i think that's the cultivated variety that's in my window um there are there i, I probably should say there are a, a few uh reputable and and good places to get carnivorous plants to grow them uh so that there's never a reason to take them out of the wild poaching has been a real issue over the years but there's literally no reason for it not not just ethically but practically it, it's they're they're readily available they're not expensive and and they come with good growing instructions and so if you go to a place like california carnivores or i'm sure there are ones on the east as well you'll be able to get um you'll be able to get ethically uh, sourced plants which is very important Perfect. This next one will definitely test your memory again of a particular photo. The question came in, how did you get the black background on the filiformis sundew photo you showed? And this photo uh, appeared a little bit past the halfway point of your presentation this evening. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, by using flash, I'm illuminating the subject, which is very close to me. The background was quite a ways back. There wasn't anything in the near background for the light to bounce off of. So because I did that, I was using the flash, I had the lens stop down to a very small opening, to, again, to help with depth of field, as I explained. By doing that, anything exposed with only natural light, which at that point in the day was very early, was in the shade, was completely underexposed. So that's actually a result of using a flash um, in a setting where the natural light is already pretty dim. Um, and like, in the, as I said, in the shade uh, early in the morning, uh, often you will see like with the mantis photo, one, the reason that the sky is not underexposed is that I exposed the other camera settings uh, for, um, for, the, for the natural daylight so that everything in the, in the image that the flash wasn't hitting would be perfectly exposed. And then I dialed my flash way down to probably 1 16th power, just enough to light the foreground um, um, of the mantis that I was taking a picture of. But in the case of that, of that uh, sundew, that's how I did it. I, I, I did not expose for the ambient light. I underexposed the ambient light and used my flash at a higher power, uh, which turns the, the background dark, which is sometimes a really cool effect unless you're, you know, it does isolate the subject nicely and I think is dramatic and there's some, some conditions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And the question asker did send me a message of thanks for that answer as you're responding. Awesome. So they're much appreciated there. Um, that takes us I mean, just a moment after eight o'clock here on the East Coast, a bit earlier for you, Tom, um, and to the end of the questions that have been submitted. So once again, um, thank you so much, Tom. That was truly astounding. Thank you folks for sending in your questions and really 
just for attending tonight. It's great to see everyone and have you partake in this. Uh, one quick note before we go, um, we have a lot going on over the next few months at the Coastal Land Trust from upcoming acquisitions of new pieces of land all over the North Carolina coast, a packed fall season of land management activities, environmental education programs, both in schools and in the community. Of course, we have our annual celebration um, in the Wilmington area on September 24th. So a lot of you folks who've been involved with Land Trust for a while will be seeing invitations for that shortly. Another one of note, um, a good opportunity for learning more about the plants, environment, and maybe even some photo taking opportunities for you is the Fire in the Pines Festival, which is making a full return this year at Halliburton Park down here in Wilmington on October 8th. So we certainly hope to see you all there. Um, and as you all head out for the night, I want to bid you a good evening and please join me with a very affectionate and appreciative wave to Tom to say thank you so much. Thank you. It was it was my pleasure. And thanks to the Land Trust for giving me the opportunity and for taking care of the Stanley Reader Garden, which um, is a wonderful, wonderful place. And you should all visit it if you go to Wilmington. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Please have a wonderful evening.